I'm Lindsay Moore and welcome to my podcast, In Conversation with SMEs, or Seriously Motivated Entrepreneurs. Founder of Agnes Marketing, I'm a business development and marketing advisor to small businesses. In challenging times like these, we need to support our small businesses more than ever. So my aim through this podcast is to bring inspiration, motivation and energy to those looking to start, scale or pivot their business by hearing the stories of others who have been brave, followed their heart, kept their nerve and achieved something quite remarkable. Throughout this series, I'll be speaking to my favourite small businesses and acclaimed entrepreneurs and asking them about their highs, their lows, their wish-had-knowns and what single piece of advice they would give themselves now if they were starting out. For this episode, I was in my element talking to Andrew Pimbley of Claremont Farm about life's most simple but important joys, food, music, community and being outdoors in nature. Andrew and his brother are the fourth generation of Pimbleys to farm the land at Claremont Farm on the Wirral, which they've been doing since 1904. As tenant farmers, they don't own the land, so they need to make it work as hard for them as possible while they have their lease. And with farming having been in decline for a number of decades, Andrew and his family have been entrepreneurial and innovative in how they have diversified and extended their offering beyond growing fruit and vegetables. As well as their shop and cafe, they host Farm Feast, a festival of food, drink and live music for people of all ages to come together and enjoy. They have a fishery and even put on cookery and bushcraft skills experience, and that's only the half of it. But always at the very heart of their business is a passion and a commitment to bringing the best of the region's produce to their local community and bringing their community together to enjoy life's simplest pleasures. Like for so many businesses who supply food to our communities, Claremont had to quickly adapt when the first lockdown happened back in March stepping in to feed their local community when the supermarket's national and global supply and logistics chains failed. I was truly energised and inspired by my conversation with Andrew, hearing him talk with such passion and enthusiasm for what he does. Andrew seems to thrive on thinking of new ideas and isn't afraid to try new things. He says, don't be afraid of failing, always try new things, follow your gut. If it doesn't work, then it doesn't work, but you'll have learned something from it. Andrew Pimbley, welcome ever so much to to this edition of In Conversation With. It's it's a real joy and a pleasure to speak to you. Um, I have been a fan of Claremont Farm. Well, I moved to the Wirral 17 years ago, so I'm probably locally considered a new girl on the block um, because I know people um, live here forever. Um, But I, I came across... Claremont Farm probably about 12 years ago when I, I I came to an event that you were hosting um in your grounds Wirral Food and Drink Festival and it was oh, I thoroughly enjoyed it because it was almost in one place it was a celebration of the most amazing local produce and it was bringing all ages of the community together to enjoy this these amazing products and uh, pork pie which I still think about to this day and I can't remember who sold it to me but if I knew maybe you can tell me I'd be visiting their shop again um, and since then you know 12 years ago is a long time I suppose in many respects but I've watched with interest as you've evolved your proposition um, in lots of different ways but really keeping at the very heart of what you're trying to do all about celebrating and bringing to the local community the best of what the area has to offer through our local produce and I've noticed how you've expanded and you've brought different parts of the community together who share who share that so from strawberry picking for you know little kids to the farm feast which is the festival that you do now with live music and everything else and um you're, you've got, I know that you've got a new cafe, which I'll ask you about, and a beautiful farm shop. And your cafe, by the way, I have done extensive research on this, and it is officially the best breakfast on the Wirral. <laughs> and I've definitely, put, 
I've definitely put in the hard yard in uh, making sure I've sampled them all. Can I really ask you about the, the you know, the history really and, and um, of Claremont Farm and, you know, you're a fourth generation business? We are, yes. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you, for, thank you for having me on. Uh, it's always <laughs> good to talk about um, Claremont. I, I, I do enjoy talking about it because it has been a long journey and obviously, you know, the family's been here farming Claremont for, you know, since 1906. So we don't actually own the land. We're, we're tenant farmers. So we have a hundred year lease or four generations and myself and my brother are the last generation for it to officially get passed down to. And then after that, it'll probably be like a 25 year lease. And, you know, the price will probably, you know, quadruple or whatever, you know, it, it's a right. totally different game now than it was uh, back in 1906. You can't get these kind of historic 100 year tenancy agreements. So, yeah, we started farming. We The family used to farm in McGull. And then we moved over to the Wirral and we took on Claremont Farm. And it was really my um, my granddad, really, that went over to America. And he saw kind of the farms selling direct to the public. And they were the first ones to be doing farmers markets and pick your own. And then he kind of brought all a lot of those ideas back to Claremont. And he started up our own little farm shop selling potatoes, eggs and vegetables up in the original courtyard, the old sandstone buildings. And he also started probably around 50 years ago, the, the pick your own fruit, the pick your own strawberries. and And that was kind of... When he did that, he kind of set us off on a path of, of being slightly different and diversifying and, and not just sticking to, you know, traditional farming, but looking at different ways to, to maximize profits. And I think being a tenant farmer and having to find a rent, um, you, you've always, I think, got to be a little bit more proactive with trying to work out different ways to you know generate income for for your business and that's kind of where it all all started and and then my dad kind of like took over from my my grandfather and he introduced asparagus and was looking at different crops and then um and then we kind of got involved well I got involved first um I forget what year it was I mean I've always worked on the farm oh you know I used to bunk off school to come and pick potatoes and <laughs> You know, just just be on the farm. I always loved it. And every summer I would then, you know, be involved in all the harvesting. It was just a, a way of life for me. And, and I loved it. But I didn't know that I wanted to be a farmer. It was pretty uncool uh, to be a farmer. And I remember when my dad used to come and pick me up from school in the old farm car and it was battered and rusty and all the rest of it. I used to like hold my head in shame and just think, <laughs> oh, can you pick me up from, you know, the bottom of the road? And I remember one sports day, you know, everyone was there and the groundsman had left his tractor there. And of course, dad was asked to move the tractor. And I was like, oh, my <laughs> word. <laughs> and it was just, yeah, it just it wasn't even on the horizon at school either. You know, it was all more the professions, uh, you know, be a lawyer, be a doctor, be one of these professions. But farming wasn't even there. And it was only because I completely messed up my A-levels. Um, I'm not, I wasn't an academic. I never have been an academic. And the only place that would take me was agricultural college. And so kind of by default, I ended up, you know, falling into agriculture, I suppose. And and, ju and just to say, I probably should have said this when I was introduced, you're an arable farm, aren't you? So you, you, um, you just grow, we are, yeah. So it's so yeah, it's just, just kind of vegetables like vegetables and fruit. Just vegetables and crops. We used to be a mixed farm. So up in the original farmyard and and some of the pictures we've got downstairs, you see we used to have uh, cattle. We used to have pigs. There's pig styles yeah. at the back. You know, back in 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 those days, it was more kind of like you were growing your own feed to feed the uh, the animals, and we had chickens as well. And and it each farm was much more diverse. But then you know animals are hard work and obviously grandfather couldn't go away to America for long periods of time without yeah. someone always having to look after these animals so we got rid of the animals in the end and we just moved to arable we've got a couple of pigs now and a few sheep but they're not commercial we just have those as, as pets really and uh, it's interesting there that you say about you know diversifying and that obviously you you wanting to you're conscious that you've got to make the the, the the land that you've got work as hard for you as you can while you while you 
while you're on it. Um, and I know there's been, well, a general recession and decline, really, hasn't there, in farming over recent decades? And um, I know through reading that I've been doing that the you know the government have published figures that 62 percent of uk farms are now having to diversify alongside running a traditional farm in order to survive really um and i'd just be interested because obviously you've been involved with the farm your whole life and what are the differences that you've noticed in farming in recent decades and how it's been affected yeah it's it's interesting because when my father was farming, it was quite profitable. You know, my grandfather, my dad made good livings out of it, you know, had, uh, was, were able to afford, you know, a nice house. And then kind of in the 90s when, um, you know, the supermarkets really took a hold and then they were shipping cheap food in from all over the world. And, you know, the, the British farmers just couldn't compete. And they couldn't compete because it's expensive to produce in this country, whether it's the infrastructure, whether it's wages, whether it's fuel costs, you know, we, we are ex expensive. And so um, supermarkets really said, well, we're not going to pay you anymore. Uh, and if you want to supply us, we're going to pay you peanuts. We're not going to um, give you contracts. We are, you know, they were, they were quite hard handed, hard handed. And some of the, the stories that you hear about, people who had had to deal with the supermarkets are not particularly nice. And so the, the, the price is just kind of like leveled out about in the 90s. And they really haven't gone up that much ever since. And yet all the cost of everything else has. And so farm incomes and farm profits have just been squeezed. And, and so it was really out of, out of necessity that when I finished uh, school, and then I went off and I worked in Australia on various different farms, came back, went to agricultural college. And then I came back. I left agricultural college and I came back and I diversified the farm shop because I really saw that my dad was working very, very hard, producing all these amazing you know, vegetables and fruits and was trying to sell it on the open market in Liverpool and just getting really a pittance for it. So, uh, you know, I, Went to agricultural college, learned a bit about diversification, a bit about marketing. So came back, diversified the farm shop, went around and looked at um, other little farm shops that were starting off and, and you know, went around to all the other farms and fresh food producers and said, right, I want to sell your products, you know. Um, and that's how it started. We put a cheese counter in. We got loads of farmhouse cheeses, loads of local meats, started doing this, that, and the other. And, and, and that was kind of like the start of um, my part of the diversification of, of Claremont Farm. And then I went off again to Africa, and worked in Zimbabwe and Mozambique on farms and building fishing camps and doing all that, these things. And then I, I came back after that and uh, there was still no work for me and the farm shop was doing well but there still wasn't really an opening for me so i got another job went off to venezuela uh cattle ranching for three years and then eventually i was like right i've, I've done working for other people I, I feel that i can really have a go at claremont farm so i came back and um i started with looking at why we weren't getting a good price for our produce and you know the fact that the open market you it was just getting flooded with stuff that the supermarkets uh, didn't want basically so farmers were having to produce almost 25 percent more than what they could sell to the supermarkets and what they didn't sell to them they would just flood the market with so we were really up against it we were up against the big boys and we're only a small farm so i started taking that product and um going to the chefs in the local restaurants and into liverpool and saying look we can pick this product in the morning we can deliver it in the afternoon and you can have it on somebody's plate um by the evening and it was incredible that everyone was just like yes there wasn't one restaurant that said no and i thought this is this is fantastic and you know it was the fact that they could um, we could create a story. We, they could tell a story when they're sitting at, the, at, you know, taking somebody's order at the table. They could say, look, this is from, you know, 10 miles away. It's been harvested this morning. It's fresh now. And, and that's where I really saw that 
we are never going to compete with the big boys, but we have to find our niche and we have yeah. to be able to do something that the supermarkets will never do. And that's sell a story and an experience. And that's kind of where I saw the light. And, and that's kind of where we've continued on to now. You know, we, we will never compete with anyone on the high street, the big supermarkets. But what we can do is we can sell an experience. We can get, you know, how you said you yeah. kind of almost bought into Claremont Farm. Well, you, you you struggle to buy into the big corps or all the rest of it. And yeah. That's where our unique selling point is in the niche. And from that kind of selling to the, the local restaurants, we started selling to local farm shops. And then that's when I wanted to start that rural food and drink festival. And I was like, I know about local produce, but a lot of the local community don't. And so the Wirral Food and Drink Festival was brought about by creating a celebration of food and drink and what's on our doorstep that we don't get the chance to even buy or see the chance to speak to that producer that farmer find out about the story about producing that cheese about that meat because food you know is that social the thing that binds us all together we sit mm. down we have our family meals we you know we used to go out to the shops we used to go to the marketplaces we used to talk you know food was always at the center of it and unfortunately supermarkets kind of stripped that away a little bit and became this kind of like mass produced um very tasteless bland wrapped in plastic produced because of its either its color its longevity and not because of its taste or its history and so we were kind of like the anti supermarket and and that's kind of like where we where we kind of started with the seeds and then it's kind of bloomed from there i guess really you've been true to what you know best so you you're all about local uh, best quality produce but as a business owner as well it's interesting to hear you say you really nailed your niche early on and that's when you really were able to talk directly to the people who bought into what you were the same things that you were trying to do as they were because you're never going to convert someone who's always just wanting to buy the cheapest or uh, you know so you really knew who your audience were um, and that diversification with that as the very centre of it, um, you know, I'm in, I know that you came into full time working in your farm in 2004 and the farm was a very a, quite a different proposition then, wasn't it? As I, said, I know you always have a small farm shop and have done for 50 years. Um, but I've enjoyed seeing the huge amount of diversification. And can you just explain a bit about how a what what how you've diversified and what you what you're now doing but also i'm interested to know how you came up with those ideas and the entrep because you've got you have to have an entrepreneurial skill to be able to think of those things and is that you is that something that's just in you anyway are you an ideas person or <laughs> yeah i think so um I don't know. I think the traveling, I think going to different countries and seeing their appreciation for food, how different farmers were interacting with their uh, audiences. At the end of the day, when I came back to Claremont, the ultimate goal was to sell more of what we could grow in our farm at the maximum profit to make yeah. it profitable. So how I did that was creating a festival. The festival brought more people to the farm we could spread it to a wider audience. They got to know about Claremont Farm. They got to know about the Claremont Farm asparagus, the strawberries, the pick your own. And I always thought that the more people that knew about us, that got us, would come back and, you know, and support us. And, you know, and that was the same with the restaurants. I could sell it for a good profit if I was delivering it. Um, it would be on the menus. I could create this narrative, that's this story that I wanted as many people to know about Claremont Farm as possible. And and then I got together. I was working with Northwest Fine Foods and there was a chef there called Brian Meller. And um, he was uh, he was a, a great guy who was doing lots of stuff with local produce. And I said, look, I want to build a kitchen on the farm and I want to get people to come to the farm to be able to, you know, come and pick the food and then cook it in the kitchen and eat it, you know, zero food miles, food, field to fork. So we started this business called Chef and Farm. We went off, we got a porter cabin. Um, and I said, I need to put an extension. I need a dining room on the end of this porter cabin. And we need to be able to host events there. And, and so I came back and I took my own money because the farm didn't really have any money to to take a punt on, should we say, and I spent five thousand pounds building an extension, and yet that 
then gave us a destination somewhere right. to host people and and then that kind of like started growing and then i um we we joined something called the higher level environmental stewardship scheme and um part of that scheme we were able to give free visits to social groups to schools and all the rest of it and so i i started that and then i was doing 70 school visits a year and then i was interacting with these kids that have never seen a strawberry plant growing you know some of them yeah. from the poorest wards on the wirral liverpool they never i mean they've never been to a, a green grocers they've only seen supermarkets a lot of them a lot of them have just eaten processed foods you know because we kind of skipped a generation with the whole cooking thing and that's yeah. that's another issue but it was a chance to get these kids to come and be on a farm to see strawberries grown in tunnels on tabletops to to get them to pick it to taste it to tell them about pollination and flowers and the importance of bees then take them out to the fields where they could see our oh, pick your own strawberries where we grow six different varieties of strawberries where they could taste a different strawberry and you can just see that a part of their lives which was just food which was just a necessity that they just ate and was suddenly this whole new thing because another issue with with food is that people don't give it the respect because it's cheap it's undervalued when mm. they see it in the supermarket and it's two for one they don't care whether they buy it and they throw one away because it's cheap and really there's so much effort and you know not only does the earth and its resources have to put a lot into producing that food but then there's harvesting and there's packaging and there's transport and all the rest of it there's a lot of effort that goes into that but we're oblivious to it because the supermarkets do their best to not show us all mm -hmm. that they just pack it up in a nice little plastic packet anyway so that opportunity to show children as well where their food came from and hopefully it, you know plant a seed and ignite something and hope hopefully they would come back and do the pick your own and then they'd come to the shop and all the rest of it so all these little diversifications and and the festival as well so you know this that that music and that celebration and having a party and yeah you no know, then you're all everyone's connected to claremont farm in all these different ways and the, yeah and it kind of snowballed from there and, and that's what i wanted to create and then you create a community and with a community you get support and i was supporting them by producing fresh fruit and produce and putting on the pick your own and they were supporting me by coming and and coming to the shop coming to the events and and that's how it was working as a community um and that was great that's that's all i ever wanted you know and it, it, it's 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 been superb yeah superb. i think as well it's like you, because of your diversifications, I mean, I know you've got a fishery, you've got the place that I love to go for breakfast, which is your cafe, you've got your food, sh your, your shop, which I love your infused olive oil, and I keep going back and refilling it, and um, you're obviously in non-COVID times, you're doing your events, and you pick your own. I think because you're diversified, you're giving people, you're continuing to give people the opportunity to come back to you, and to be introduced to you, or enjoy your ethos and everything you stand for in lots of different ways and I like to and it's interesting because you've got such a broad market when obviously you're right in the center of the Wirral you're, you're really slap bang in between east and west and um great location but the age range of people that come um there's something for everybody to enjoy almost you know uh, well not almost definitely um and I yeah that's that Sorry, come on. sorry. It, it was so. It's quite. It's interesting that you say that. So, we're all food and drink festival and farm shops. There was a kind of forty-five to kind of sixty-five age uh, bracket, and um, e even the food and drink festival was a slightly older market and like farmers market. So, I had to engage a younger audience, and so farm feast, which was the food music. I got a little bit bored of the food and drink festival after a while. We did it for nine years. Everyone was doing it. It was just a bit samey, samey, all the chefs coming out. And, and I wanted to do something a little bit different. And I needed to engage with a slightly younger audience. So I actually, um, you know, thought up this food music festival. And it was uh, one of your other uh, people, Johnny Bongo, who you'd interviewed before. Um, he was a good friend of mine. And he came down and did a couple of DJ sessions as well. But suddenly you're getting that 18 yeah. to 35 age group. You're getting the young families. And that was exactly when we launched the Farm Shop and Cafe that we launched Farm Feast. And 
Farm Feast was one of the highlights of my life because it was an amazing party. But I also lost quite a lot of money. And that's my personal money. It wasn't Clam Farm, Claremont Farms money with that. So it, it was highs and lows because it was actually the best springboard for the new farm shop and cafe as a destination for families and young people. Yeah. And since then, and since having that connection, then social media as well, having the festivals and having something you know, um, that would appeal to a younger generation and also the social media. We, we, we grew our kind of like uh, numbers and our followers uh, massively during those uh, couple of years where we did those festivals and they've stuck with us. Yeah. And so now, you know, we used to mess around with newspaper adverts for the pick your own. We used to really struggle with getting our, our information out there. We used to put signs up. Now I, 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 I almost have to be a little bit quiet about what we put up because there's, you get such an immediate response from social media. Um, that, that's been quite a significant turning point for us. But you need the audience to begin with. Mm. And that's where the festivals and doing the more diverse things at the beginning really helped us engage with a much younger audience. And Because once they find us, they love us. You know, it's such a great meeting point. But there's still something about a farm shop that's, you know, you'd almost think kind of like 45, 65. Yeah. But once the younger generation actually come and experience it, um, they, they, they love it. And that's what mm -hmm. we're seeing. A lot more younger families coming in and making the most of Claremont Farm now as well. Um, when you say about, the, you know, it's, it's, you know, your social media takes a life of its own um, through the people that engage with it. You know, you, that's quite hard to pull off that. And I think... I don't I don't think I know I know by looking at your feed and by following you on social media myself you're not try hard in terms of you're not trying to engineer what should we post today we've got to keep pushing out content for the sake of content I think it's because people buy into the authenticity of what you're trying to do and I think they see you as authentic and I think I think they see you as um doing good stuff um providing good quality but providing a great experience so whether you're sitting in your cafe and you're you know you your staff are lovely and your food's amazing or mooching around and spending a Saturday afternoon mooching around your shop or whether it's going fishing for the day or whether it's picking your own pumpkin and getting or getting the kids to a drive-in cinema whatever it might be you know because I know you do the drive-in cinemas um for the in conjunction with the story house don't you in Chester and That's right. Yeah, it's, it's like it, you've taken something and you've definitely created a hub for the community to come together and to enjoy something authentic and genuine in a in a in a great environment. That's why I like going. <laughs> yeah, it's. Do you know what? I I love life. I I've travelled. I every year I try and get away. Like last year. Uh, I did like two weeks in Nepal. I go away on my own. Um, the year before that, I did four weeks. I went and saw Everest. Wow. Um, and I've got a family and I've got two kids, but my wife, we got married this year. But um, So I, I keep forgetting to call her my wife. But it's getting more used to it. Thank you. But I, I love life. I love food. I love nature. I love the earth. I love music. You know, we put on these dance parties here, the Bonsai Hi-Fi, and they're all vinyl and everything, every song's played from beginning to end. It, it, it comes from kind of like the David Mancuso loft parties. You know, people come and they dance and they have the best time. It's, it's the basics of yeah. enjoyment of life is nature, you know, community, food, music. And I, I am passionate that about those things and I just put on whatever I want to do yeah. in a way and what I think I love doing P other people will love that I love Claremont Farm I love putting on events here for people to enjoy because it's important yeah. and you know yeah the social media I just I'm so blase about it because it's not hard, nothing nothing you can't sell stuff on. you can put an event on but you can't sell stuff on social media people see through yeah. that so I really do just put up nice pictures of the farm and what's going on and you know and, and people engage in that they don't want the hard sell social media really should be about a nice place that you can go um i'm conscious of being on my phone too much um so i don't i, I don't you know post all the time or think i've got to post three times a day you know there might be a couple of days where i don't go it might be a week when i go without i'm not a hard 
you know, I've got to do this, got to do that for the sake of the business. It's just what I want to put out there sort of thing and informative stuff and all the rest of it. And I think that shows because you can get other businesses that try and do the 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 more staged photo of product and all the rest of it. And no one's bothered. You know, no one's particularly bothered that way. And it's not what I want to do yeah. or how I want to sell or present Claremont Farm either. It's got to be. People love the personal touch. People love my dog, Aggie. You know, because Aggie sits outside the front door meeting and greeting a lot of the time at the shop. She hangs around. You know, she's become a real character. So, you know, I take photos of the dog and when we're out on walks because I go for a walk every day and try and get away. And it's just a it's, it's Claremont Farm and the social media is just we're all together as one. And, and, and that's what the photos show, I suppose, in a way. Yeah. So, you know, obviously you've explained there how you've, you've spent – uh, you've 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 built, you've created a hub for the community to come and enjoy something that brings them together, which is food and drink and music and great produce, um, and the the simplest pleasures, but the most important pleasures of, in life, really. So, we're recording this in 2020, and um, what a year it's been. And I just I'm just interested to ask you that, well, a few things about this actually. How how have you how have you felt that that sense of independent businesses fitting in with the local community and supporting each other has has that come into focus for you much more strongly this year through COVID? Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, something I, I didn't say that I was passionate about was independent business and community. You know, I see too much of these big businesses, Amazon, online sales, the big supermarket. It's too easy just to not think about where your pound goes. The ripple effect of every time you buy something cheap from China, what are you doing to a local business here? What are the air miles? What's the carbon footprint of that produce you're bringing in? I always say shop local, save the planet. That's my little hashtag. It, you know, because it's so simple. What more do we actually need than to go to our few local shops and, and buy that stuff and, you know, look after the environment and be socially conscious and feel that you, your money you're putting back into your local community, you know, and, and that's something else that I'm really, really passionate about. And it frustrates me when, you know, you know, people just say, oh, it doesn't matter if I buy it there. Or it doesn't matter if it's everything's got made in China. On Well, yes, it does. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we need our own industries. We need our own local businesses. Because, as it, you know, 2020, when the supermarkets couldn't, when they went into first into lockdown and supermarkets, um, they didn't have enough delivery drivers. They didn't have enough weekly slots. People were panicking. People said, well, I've, I'm, I'm vulnerable. I can't come to the shop now. I'm supposed to be isolating. Can you help? And suddenly people that we'd never seen that were just happy going to the Asda or the, the Sainsbury's were coming and seeking us out and and we were able to adapt that's the beauty of local businesses you know we can adapt we can change and we were able to create a click and collect we were doing a weekly delivery and we looked after the most vulnerable in our community and we could do that and um and I think for that time people really saw us as you know, a little bit of a haven where they could come and still get the local produce. We were still just the same commu family community that were, you know, selling stuff. And, and it was great. And I, I do feel it kind of almost cemented our place within society in this little community here within, you know, the, the Wirral sort of thing. And, and even within Bevington Spittle, we were in walking distance. Um, and, yeah, it, it was just something just quite nice about being that and suddenly the spotlight was on us and other little local businesses that were looking after their local community and it was it was nice it was actually quite nice to to be in that position to be able to 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 help people and yes we're always here we've been here for years it was nice for people to find us and um yeah, I know obviously the coronavirus was horrendous for some people, but, you know, here it's 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 been OK. You know, and we managed to stay open and we were able to give and um, provide people with fresh fruit and vegetables for for the entire lockdown. And, and are you finding that those the, the new people, the new people that had a newfound appreciation of, of their local business, um, your farm in this instance, have they continued to support you? We have seen so yes, we're we 
the farm shop is probably 30 percent up okay. i would say yeah. on last year it's this latest lockdown has been quiet but what we found is less people are out browsing and people are just out shopping yeah. so even though we're getting less footfall and it is quite quiet you know still the the numbers and the actual sales are still you know good because people are just coming out and they're doing solid and we've carried on with our click and collect and we've carried on with our deliveries and you know uh, we're still looking after the most vulnerable people that need our help sort of thing mm -hmm. so yes it's 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 been it has been a strange year it's been frustrating because obviously the cafe we've had to close that and then we opened and then we closed again and we built a veranda and you know um where people felt self safe to come because it's outside and it was a covered area they feel, felt safe to to meet other households but then obviously we've had to shut again and then the big unknown we're waiting for today for you know the announcement about the latest lockdown and where we're going to which tier we're going to go into as from next week but we don't know whether we're actually going to open again because i would imagine if people are allowed to meet for christmas we're going to be in another situation where we're going to have to lock down in january so mm -hmm. that that's that's frustrating it's nice to have the constant of the farm shop and that's a little bit of normality mm -hmm. you know um people just coming in and just shopping yeah the the, the cafe is just a different entity but the farm shop there's just something very soothing about knowing we're going to be here um every day to to offer those services and one of the best things that i that came out of it personally for me was i hadn't harvested asparagus for the best part of maybe i don't know almost 20 years maybe a little bit less maybe you know 10 years and when we couldn't get our um uh, we we've, we've got a group of polish guys and girls that come over and they've been coming over they've been coming over for about 20 odd years and uh, they couldn't come over this year so uh, i had to get a group of uh, local people that had, uh, were out of work or being furloughed and and put them here on the farm and it was it was incredible that was that was the best thing cuz just that simplicity of getting up in the morning opening the farm shop and then going down and cutting asparagus was was brilliant for me to to go to the same field every yeah. day and yeah i absolutely loved that so yeah, pros and cons really for 2020 you know, and coronavirus because we've we've branched out and it's made us diversify again. So we're looking at we obviously put the brand and then we did these acoustic nights outside and these we teamed up with some of the um, artists that play for Liverpool Philharmonic and they came and created the Claremont Ensemble and um, we were doing food and drink and music and outdoor safe you know, socially distanced and all the rest of it. So that pushed us a different way. And we're looking at putting an outdoor pizza parlor in oh, wow. that we can do. Yeah. So that we can do and service the events that are going to be happening because that's where we're going to be is more outdoor events. And so working with story house as well, um, we, we want to be able to service that with our own food and drink because we got people in to help us um, last year, uh, sorry, at the beginning of the year. And uh, we want to be able to, basically do it all in-house yeah. um, moving forward. So, you know, different different arms, different strands are, are going to oh come from this. Yes. Wow. So, ju so just to wrap up then, and this is what I ask all my guests, what's your biggest high? What's your, what, your, your, low, your low point, really? And you wish I'd known? <laughs> I did think about this. Um, the, the, the lowest point was losing all that money on Farm Feast. I think, and you know, it was thirty grand, wow. and I've still got debt now from that festival. Um, so yeah, getting that wrong, working with the wrong people, uh, the weather, and just having, just putting too much on for not quite getting it right. Basically, um, I think that was the biggest low and the biggest worry, really, for me personally. Um, other lows have been yeah well there's there's always lows and i suppose over the years but okay so biggest high would have been getting planning permission for the new farm shop and cafe because that was a real struggle and we had to get a, a grant um to be able to basically put the building up a, a new build and get planning permission and when that actually came through and we got the green light um, that also meant that myself and my brother could stay here on the farm and make a viable business out of it so that was probably one of my the high points of of claremont farm um and what was the other one that was the Which third I'd one known. oh geez 
I mean, that goes hand in hand with biggest low, doesn't it, really? Uh, wish I'd known. Um, wish I'd known. I, d I don't even know. Wish I'd known. <laughs> <laughs> to be quite honest. Sometimes because, yeah, I wish I'd known. Know, you know, not to know because you wouldn't have done it. It is thing. because, you know, Farm Feast was still a, one of the best adverts for the farm and, and the new farm shop cafe. I met Barney through that who is now works with me on all the events to put on uh, at claremont farm and i'd be lost without him so uh but i wish i'd no well I, yeah yeah i don't even know about the wish i'd known because um everything that i've done you know even the the low points and things that have gone wrong they've always turned out or you've always learned something that has pushed you forward and that's always something that i've always felt is that that almost the more you fail, the, the more you can yeah. move forward okay. because you're trying. Yeah. And, um, and, and I've, you know, I was always, uh, you know, bottom in my class at school and I was always failing and I failed my A-levels. But because of all those failures, you know, I went, ended up going to agricultural college, ended up like falling in love with farming. I ended up um, not being afraid to fail and just try things and just do it. And I think that was one of the, you know, the best things that could have happened to me growing up was that um, that that lack of <laughs> worry when it came to fame. It was just try it, you know, go follow your gut and just put it on. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, you know, but you'll have learned something from it for sure. So I've never been afraid to, 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 to put something on and just give it a go. And if it didn't work, it doesn't work. And you just got to suck it up, haven't you, really? Um, um, and would that be, what would that be your advice, really, to other people thinking of starting a business or thinking about where to go from here? Would it, would it, if you yeah, had one piece of advice, it, would it be that? Yeah, don't be afraid to fail because you'll learn something from failing. And as long as you don't put yourself in to massive financial debt that you can't get yourself out of and then you're stuffed, you know, try and be a bit sensible about it, but just try anything and be disruptive. Do something completely different, um, you know, and make a, a song and dance about it when you when you do it. You know, be noisy, be, you know, you want everyone to to see what you're doing. And, and that gives it its, its best chance at, uh, at being successful. Um, and, and listen to your gut. You know, your gut instinct knows if you think it's not going to work, then it's not going to work. But if you think, if you've really got a passion for it or you really believe in it, people will believe in that. They'll see that shining through in your business. And I think that's part of why Claremont's been so, you know, I suppose so successful because the whole family that work here, my mum, my dad, my brother, ourselves, we are so passionate about it. When people come here, they can almost, you know, feel it. They can feel the family, the, the history, what we're trying to achieve, you know, with supported local produce the best food, you know, that kind of stuff. They, they can feel that and they buy into it and it makes people want to come back. And, and I suppose the social media is a little bit of an extension of that as well. And people can, you know, it feels genuine because it is genuine. And, and you know, if you're not genuine, people see straight through that. So, you know, be as, you've got to be as genuine as you can with a business. Totally. Andrew, thank you ever so much for the time. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. It's, and I'll be, as soon as, as soon as, regulations allow i'll be back for me breakfast <laughs> no, fantastic great Thanks talking to very you very much indeed okay bye bye thanks for listening i really hope you enjoyed this episode of in conversation with seriously motivated entrepreneurs i'm on a bit of a mission to provide help and support to small businesses as well as my podcast and working hard to provide lots of helpful and practical advice to help small businesses get really good at business development and marketing from free masterclasses and cheat sheets to downloadable guides and consultancy sessions. If you would like to access this information, it's all available on my website, agnesmarketing.co.uk. And if you'd like to join our Facebook community of other small businesses, looking to access and share marketing advice, tips and support, please search for Agnes Marketing on Facebook. And would you mind if I ask you something? If you've liked what you've listened to today, can you please rate, review and subscribe to this podcast as it will help other business owners to find it and it might just provide the inspiration and motivation they need at this moment in time. Thanks so much.